Hi everyone, welcome on board to our YouTube channel where we're bringing God's word to you fresh as it comes into my heart. Um, today I'll be dealing with something that's close to my heart um, and there's several reasons I feel at this season and at this time someone needs to voice something out to address certain issues. Um, I'm aware of what's been going on around in the social media and a lot of controversy regarding giving and concerning giving in church. And this has brought a lot of um, confusion. Um, um, in fact, it's come to the point where even believers are hating one another. This ought not to be so. We'll look together into God's word and understand God's mind regarding this today. So today we'll be looking at the act of giving, the act of giving, the biblical act of giving, and we'll approach it the God's way. And we'll be looking today at just three basic fundamentals, some prerequisites, some foundational truth, such things that should be in place when we are really giving as believers. I'm not judging, I'm not condemning, I'm not speaking against anyone. I'm here to convey God's love through his word as regarding giving. Nothing like us knowing the truth. We must walk in the light of the truth of God's word. I'll pray briefly and then we'll look at a few scripture. Father, speak to our heart. Bring enlightenment to everyone, Father. The Bible says the entrance of your word, it gives understanding and it gives light and understanding even to the naive. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Okay, let's look at three fundamental um, truth or foundational important truth that must be in the place before any kind of giving is actually engaged in or done by the believer, by the Christian, all right? We'll look at number one, Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter 4, the first foundational thing or important thing that must be in our lives before any kind of giving. I use the word any kind of giving because there are different types of giving in scripture. Many a times believers actually think giving has only to do with tithes, which is such a big controversy today, and offerings, which is a big issue in church today, and people are all in anger and in bitterness, some for, some against. Well, I understand this. The world has come to a point where everyone appears to have a voice with the new rise of social media. It's not a bad thing altogether, but we need to come back, if you're a child of God, into God's word and check which is of God and which is not. And I said, there are different types of giving. We must understand that to every type of giving, there are certain blessings that God intends to communicate to the believer. We must understand this. I've been in church for a while. I've been in church for a while. Uh, you could call me a church kid. I wasn't born a Christian. I didn't come necessarily from a Christian family, but I've been in church, I haven't given my life to Christ at an early age. And after that, I've evolved and I've seen things and I've heard things in church. Depending on where I'm from, someone will say, yes, but the truth of the matter was someone brought the gospel to me. And with that, I've been around. And one of the fundamental religious things that has crept in among many things is that people tell us that give to God even if you don't receive. It sounds right, sounds spiritual, but it's wrong. No farmer goes to sow without expecting a harvest. Write that down. No farmer goes to sow any crop without expecting a harvest. The first reason he goes to sow on the ground is because he expects a harvest. And that tells me that to every giving we give, we expected to have a return. We are expected to have a return. Jesus was speaking of the sower. That has to do with the word we know. But he, in his explanation in the parable of the sower, his statement was this, that when it comes, it comes in some will get a hundredfold, some sixty. So you see, there is a return. Every sower that sets out to sow expects a return. Everyone that gives in obedience to God's word is, should expect a return, should expect a blessing. Now, to every type of giving, there is a type of blessing that ascribed to it which I hope to bring to us. Now, if I practice a particular type of giving and the blessing that should come to it will come to me, 
Now, if I do not practice the other type of giving, then I shouldn't expect any kind of increase. Let me make it easy this way. To every type of game, the sport is a sport generally, but there are different types of sport game. For example, we have cricket and we have baseball. No matter how they look similar, they have different rules with it and different rules guides it. So if I practice cricket, now there is a rule I need to learn so I can score ultimate um, scores in cricket. If I go to baseball, I must now change the rule. So to every type of practice and giving, there are rules that governs it. And that is the basic truth. But yet, as much as I say this, we come to the very foundation which I'm just dealing with today and right now. It's simple that your type of giving, no matter the type of giving, there are three things fundamentally that must be on, on the table. It must be in play. Three fundamental things. And with these three fundamental things, we can now via or move into the distinctive type of giving, knowing what blessings God has for us there. It is not wrong, and I repeat, it is not wrong to practice it out of your love for God with an expectation for an increase. It is sounds spiritual, sounds religious, but it is not of God to go with the mentality, I just want to give because I love God, even if I don't. Beautiful, said, well said. But the fact is, God does not want you to give even if he doesn't respond. God responds to obedience and responds to giving. The Bible says, if you're obedient and if you'll be obedient and willing, you will eat the good of the land. So there is something that God wants to bring into communicating to our life. Hence, God encourages us as children of God to practice even the simple act of giving. All right, bless be God. Now, Thinking about giving and the acts, the number one thing of a prerequisite, a foundational truth that must be in my life and the life of every child of God for us to practice biblical giving and see the harvest. Because what I've come to realize is many a times we practice giving, but the harvest never comes to our lives. And then we excuse it away. Why, why do you really have to receive from the Lord? We give excuses. We give reasoning. We try to excuse it. We try to escape it. But the honest fact is that there should be a, 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 a harvest. Now, I may not be able to determine the time frame of the harvest, but I will definitely get the harvest. That's the mind of God from Scripture. Now, three fundamental things I keep saying. Let's start by the first one. The Bible tells us, Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, I said Genesis 4, we find that the first foundational truth I found in Scripture, and this is where the Bible started giving. This is the foundation of giving any type. We find it in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 5, and this is important, and I'll tell you the first point after I read this. The Bible says that in the process of time, I'm reading from the New King James Version, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain, brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel. Depending on the translation, some would say, and God received Abel. He said, and his offering, two things. He received Abel, then he received his offering. The Bible goes on and says, but he did not respect or receive depending on your translation, Cain and his offering. He did not receive Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. All right? And his countenance fell. The first fundamental thing is right there. The fact is that there were two principles. Number one, God must accept the giver. In other words, my life must be acceptable by God. My life must be pleasing or received by God. God must be pleased with who I am, with my person, with my life, with my place. Where am I with God? I must have a relationship that is worthwhile with the Lord. There is no use. You see, there is no use. I don't, I'm not here to condemn. I'm not here to judge, but I'm here to study and bring God's word to our homes. There is no use, according to scripture, for any child of God, whoever he is, to actually bring an offering or anyone, whoever he is, to bring an offering to God and expect that the Lord will receive him. Listen, in our church, Rema City Church, you could come and you bring an offering and your life is not right. We will receive it. We will be glad in it. We will use it for the purpose of God's kingdom. 
but in the reality of things, you have not, you as a person, you as a believer, have not done it the right way. How? You should first make sure that you present yourself. I must be sure that my relationship with God is right. I must be sure that I have something wonderful, something right going with the Lord. I must be the child of God. I must have a life that is not found wanting in standard with God's word. I must be accepted. So the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4 that it came to pass. Two brothers, we don't know who taught them. We believe perhaps their father. We don't know if it's an instruction from God. They heard it. I don't know. But the Bible tells us a time came. There was a period where it was time to bring something to the Lord. And one who was a, a farmer brought the fat of, of, of his animal to the Lord. The other one who was into agriculture, uh, plant, planting and, and stuff like that, brought of the harvest. Now, the problem came up. What was the problem? God looked at the one that brought the, the fat and accepted, received him first. Okay, we don't know exactly why, though I have certain reasons to think in certain ways. I won't bring it up there. But he, he received him first. Then the Lord went ahead and received what he had to offer. But when he turned to his brother, he turned to Cain. He couldn't accept Cain as a person. As a result, what Cain had to offer, he could not. And if you read on in the chapter that when Cain was angry and the Lord came, God said to Cain, Cain, if you do what is right, the statement was, will you not be accepted? So the issue still remains that God must first accept the believer. Okay, you might say, oh, come on, that's Old Testament because this is one of the things we keep hearing now in church. People have become very smart, they think. And they know how to Old Testament new. And I wonder why they have their Bibles and they've not gotten rid of the Old Testament. So let's look at something again in the same line. The Bible says in the mouth of at least two witnesses, even Jesus said that, the matter is established. Okay, let's look at somewhere else. The Bible speaks of it in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, from verse 1 to 5. I'll still choose to use the New King James Version. He says, moreover, brethren, he says, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He says that in a great, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, employing us with much urgency that we will receive the gift and the fellowship of their ministering to the saints. Now hear this. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Note the word first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God, beautifully placed. He went on and was speaking about the churches in Macedonia. Now, it was no one church. This is the churches within Greece at the time. He says, listen, Paul was writing. He said, we bear witness to what was happening, that there were certain believers in the churches, in more than one church, in Macedonia. And what they were doing, they brought their substance, not because they had so much. You see, many people say, oh, oh you shouldn't pour, trouble the, 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 the poor. Not because they had so much. But the Bible was so clear. It says they brought so much, not because they necessarily had, but even out of the abundance they brought. And they went employing, persuading, please have it, take it with urgency. You needed to push this gospel forward. And they actually gave to Paul. Paul says the way they gave us was beyond what we even expected. We thought they would just give it to us. We thought they would just give their offerings. We thought they would just put money through. We thought they would just sow into missions, you know, and all those. He said, we thought they would give. He said, but they did it uniquely. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Paul was speaking in, in scripture there. Paul said, what was unique about them was they first of all gave themselves to the Lord. You see what Abel did? Abel was smarter than the brother. Abel first and foremost sorted his life with the Lord. So with the churches, the saints in Macedonia. The what they did first was give themselves to the Lord. And that is the practice of giving. 
Number one point, you must make sure that you give your life to the Lord. That your life must be given to the Lord. That your relationship, your lifestyle with the Lord is intact. So they give themselves to the Lord. Make sure there are no things of controversy in your work with God. Make sure there's nothing of sin and of want. You have to deal with it. You have to manage it as a child of God. If your giving will be worthwhile. I'm not talking, you see, one of the mistakes I've began to realize and I see amongst believers is we're narrow-minded. We think of things within the frame of human timing. But whenever God gives us a command, a charge, whenever scripture actually instructs us, it is always with eternity at mind. God is a God who lives in eternity. He doesn't live in time. So the whole issue of our giving, if you read through scripture, we'll see how we cover this. If God helps us and allows us to go that way, you find through all scriptures, even with Christ, you know, make sure that you put build up treasures in heavenly places where corruption and thieves can break. It's always internal in perspective. God expects that our giving will not just count on the earth, but will count before his, his presence in his throne room. And in eternity, it will matter for the believer. The moment you're a child of God, anything and everything you do must have an eternal value. And even in our giving, don't look at it as just material stuff here, here on earth. No, on earth, yes, but it has an eternal impact. And the Bible says they gave themselves first. Then they gave their substance. Hallelujah. And they even gave themselves to the sense. In other words, they were willing. So they are given were not just cut across now, now, now. Hallelujah. They first of all did it the right way. And this is the right way with God. Your giving first will start with your life. Make sure your life is right. I can't overemphasize this. Blessed be Jesus. The number two point, so I move very fast, is this. That from scripture or through scripture, I'm slow in reading scripture, so we catch what scripture is saying word by word. That's why I'm slow, it's deliberate. We'll find in scripture, number two point, we'll see from scripture, that it must be from a willing heart. Okay, it's a free will. Whatever type of giving, whatever type of giving, Remember, I started, there are different types. We'll see how we deal with it, not today. But we find that there are different types of giving. No matter the type of giving, one, then your life first must be accepted by God. Two, it must come as a free will offering. This, I can dwell with it for a long time. It's all written all over scripture from Old to the New Testament. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, I like this. It says, if you are willing and obedient, it's always that. It says, you shall eat the good of the land. I quoted this earlier on. If you are willing and you're obedient, you will eat the good of the land. It goes on if you want to read on. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It is always starts with willingness and obedience to the truth of God's word. That's when the harvest comes. I said to start again, you must first of all be accepted by God. Your life must be accepted. Secondly, it must come from a willing heart and a heart to obey God's word. You're obeying by what you do. If you do not give with a willing heart, forget about the harvest. Look at something. Oh, what does that have to do with giving? It's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 11. 2 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from 6 to 11. I'll try and read it a little bit faster. He said, but this I say, Paul was speaking. He says, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He says, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He says, so let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, in other words, not because somebody has pressed you, has threatened you, has coerced you. And I know this is part of the challenge going on. People feel pressured, people feel threatened, people feel cajoled, people feel lied to. So certain gimmicks, I'm aware of it, is in church. He's in church all over, especially you will find it in the charismatic Pentecostal. Don't say, oh, yes, yes, yes. We'll find it also in those we call the octodos. Trust me, but I'm not judging, so I'm not going to be too picky. Even though I can give you examples in every area you find this. But here we go. The Bible says, so let each one give as he proposes in his heart, 
No matter the kind of giving you're giving, let it be a free will. Let your heart connect. If you're not, your heart is not connect, do not give. If you give, it's worthless because you're not willing, you're not obeying. If you, it seems you're obeying but you're not willing, the whole thing is not complete. The good that God expects for you to get out of it, you will miss out of it. He says, he said, so let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. He said, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always... Now, note the word, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. I, I, I'll stop there. You can read on if you want. But for time's sake, let me stop here. God loves a cheerful giver. Hear that. A cheerful giver is somebody who gives and doesn't feel constrained during the giving or after. Is somebody who is excited. Is someone who does not keep on watching his offering. Where is he going? How is he going? How's the pastor? He bought a new car. Could it be my offering? Could... No, no, no. A cheerful giver is one who gives with joy. He gives and does not trace the money. <laughs> He's not into the tracing of the money. Now, um, we'll get to there when I, if God allows us and I speak about abuse um, in receiving and giving an offering. But that's not the point. The point here we need to understand, which I'm dwelling on today, is the foundational truth of giving. We must understand that giving must also come out of the free will. Oh, tight or no tight, first fruit or no first fruit, and, and all sorts. There are many types of giving. I mean not as a person practice all, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that the person who practices all has missed it. Let me, I'm using myself for example, grow to the point where I understand and in obedience I do it. And I speak this to some of us who are ministers of the gospel. I believe strongly God's intention is the willing and obedience. There is no use, and I tell people in church, please, if you do not want to practice this type of giving, skip your money with yourself. But to those that give, and I believe in my spirit and in my heart, for my personal work and experience, I used to look forward to certain kinds of giving. Because when I did, I saw the blessing, I saw the increase, and I saw God's own harvest for it. And I was excited to give. I was excited to give. Hallelujah. You know, everybody who gives has to look at everything. The place you're giving, the atmosphere, all those are in. But these fundamentals must be in place. Let's not beat the gun. Let's go by step by step. First, my life must be accepted by God. Number two, I must give out of a willing heart. Second Corinthians chapter 8, 1 to 5. It says, moreover, brethren, we read this. It says, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and, you notice the word, their joy, and the depth and, the, and their deep poverty abounded in riches of their liberality. It turned out to their riches. It says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, so strange, and beyond their ability, in other words, they stretch themselves out of their comfort zone. David would say, I would not give unto the Lord what doesn't cost me. So there is an aspect of giving in faith, which you give beyond where it's convenient for you. Don't always think it's when it's convenient, that's when you should be willing. Please, even when it's not convenient, sometimes you're willing to do it because of the greater, uh, the greater curse of God's kingdom. Sometimes we give and it makes us uncomfortable for the month, for a few months before we rally our finance and our situation around. But we give, there is such giving that goes beyond your comfort. I hear all sorts of teaching on social media, what if it's unfair, they don't have enough. Forget about that. The Macedonian church, we're not rich. It's very clear from Paul's perspective. And Paul said that they even give beyond the ability. He said the ability, he said they were, this is the word, were freely willing, comma, employing us with much urgency. Their willingness was so strong that they began to ask Paul. It's the word employing looks like Paul wasn't willing to even take it. Hallelujah. Paul was like, no, 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 no. You, you guys don't have, keep it. You may need, they were like, no, no, you have to have it. Why? For the greater good of missions, for the greater good of the kingdom, for the greater good you need for your upkeep. You can't be under duress and you want to share this gospel. You need to be in a comfortable situation enough for you to be able to travel, to make your journeys, to convey this gospel. The 
urgency of the kingdom of God and the truth and the propagation of this gospel is beyond any man can do. If you have a mindset that is eternal valued, you are looking at things with an eternal perspective, there is urgency. There is urgency. And because of that, the church in Macedonia began to push at it. I, I don't know how I can over you know, overemphasize the urgency of the gospel, but with it, they were willing. So the second step I've just pointed out is your willingness. Yes, my life is accepted by God. Number two, I am too willing. I am too willing. I must be willing. If you're not willing, I will encourage you. Pastors have to forgive me. If any person is not willing, do not be so hungry to go for the money. Let the person be. Rather pray that God will bring their eyes of their understanding to the praise of great enlightenment like Paul does preaches and prayed about. But we'll go on. Praise the Lord. Okay, the third thing that must be in place quickly, so I, but for time's sake, is that you must have a heart and a life free of offense. I say this because it's quite complicated. Someday, if God allows, I may come to us and teach on the issue of offense. But we must have a life free of offense. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 uh, to 24. It says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there, remains, uh, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Very strange. I doubt if we do speak about this much in church. Thirdly, this is the main climax of what I'm doing today, is make sure you are free of offense. We're talking about giving. What connection? Don't ask me. Ask the master Jesus. He says so. Don't be too hasty because you're giving. You will give and it has no record in eternity. Read the book of Revelation. Books were open. I bet in eternity when we stand before the white throne judgment of the king, Jesus himself, one of the books that will be open will be the books of our giving. And some things we'll do, we'll be wondering, how come there's no record? <laughs> I gave, why is there no record? The Bible said books. And, and the reason of it is because we've not done it the God's way. We've not done it the biblical way. We've not done the act of giving the biblical way. The way we give is that you must be free of offense. The Bible is clear. In other words, it's a difficult one. You know what? Imagine this brother now goes ahead and tries and connects with a person. And he connects with a person to make peace who is offended with him. And there is dispute or there is a disagreement. And he goes to connect and the person chooses not to forgive him or make peace. So what does he do? See, scripture also says something. It says, as much as it is in your power, be at peace with all men. The Bible also says, follow peace with all men and with holiness, which without no man will see the Lord. So we find that over and again, there are certain times, no doubt, that we will, may come across a, a brick wall in this matter where the person is not willing to make peace. That's not a problem. But you would have done as much as you can. Simply placed in this way, I should always seek peace, all right? And make sure in my heart I have no guilt, anger against any person. I may not want to keep the relationship. I'm not talking of um, uh, offense, but I have to touch this. I may not want to keep the relationship. Um, uh, it may not be healthy because it, depending on how you judge, the same issue may rise up. You may have to keep dealing with this matter. But I would rather be at peace with the person. I will know that when I think of the person or when I see the person, if I ever come across the person, there should be no painful feeling inside. I should be able to say hello. I should be able to shake hands if, if, if opportunity comes for that. Um, and I should be able to have a, a decent chat and move on. But I may not be willing and I don't have to keep the same level of relationship as before. If so, sometimes I may have to keep the same relationship as before. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and so you need to be able to be cautious and know how to manage life in offenses. But that's the different. I should be able to pray God's blessing on the person without feeling upset about it. I should be able to hear good news and be able to say praise God for the person's life. But this remains the point that I must be free from offense. Three things we've said today. 
I'll start from the, uh, um, um, the, the latter is number one, I should be free of offense before anyone. Have no, no, no ill feeling. Walk in love. That's the word. I should be in walking in love. I should be, 1 Corinthians speaks clearly about this. We might deal with it much later. 1 Corinthians 13, you know, he said, if I give myself to be burnt and, and all sorts of things I do to myself and do not have love, it profits me nothing. In other words, I could do everything I need to do, you know, give all my things to the poor, burn myself and, and be ready to give my kidneys and my heart out, charitable, and still I'm not working in love. I'm still in offense. It profits nothing. 1 Corinthians 13. Check it out. And, and but yet the Bible encourages us on and on. Number two, again, don't forget, I'm starting from, um, um, from the latter. We say walk in love. We say number two, make sure that it's a free will offering. And the first one, which we said, definitely, my life must be accepted by God. I should live a life free from sin, you know, if you want it to be simple. And anything that is not acceptable by the Lord, make peace with God. When these three things, fundamental things, prerequisites, have been, uh, have been met, have been, have been fulfilled, then I can be in a place where I say, okay, come on, pastor, what's the giving you're talking about? Tell me about it. I can now learn about that giving and be a practical doer of it. Praise God. Those are the three points I intend to share with us today. I believe someone is getting blessed. Share, share the channel. Um, um, let someone know about this. Put it on your social media. Let's spread the good news about giving. Spread the good news about giving. Let people know what is happening and, and bring the good news to God's house. I believe somebody will be blessed even as they hear this. You can look at our church on down there. It's right there for you to check out. And you see the name of the church, Rema City Church, on our YouTube channel and where we meet in Rema City TV. It'd be a wonderful opportunity to have you. Fellowship with us anytime when you're around. I want to say God bless you. We love you. And it was a wonderful time bringing God's word to you as usual. We're Manchester United Kingdom. God bless you. Praise God.